Hello, I'm Carl Wells. My guest today has such an interesting life story that we've decided to devote two episodes to this story. His life began in tragedy and great loss. He found solace in athletics, especially basketball. And in fact, he went on to build a career for himself in the game of basketball. He's written it all down in a fascinating autobiography called Chasing a Dream. And it's my pleasure to welcome Carl English to the program. Welcome, Carl. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'd like to begin by talking about your parents. Yeah. You lost both of them at the same mm -hmm. time in a, in a tragic house fire. Uh, tell me about your mom and dad, Lavinia and Kevin. For me, it's all vague memories. Um, certain things stand in my mind, things that people tell me, uh, good people, hard working. Uh, I was five at the time when we had the house fire. I, I remember the night before, which is strange. We, we came from town and we were after stopping and getting some, some uh, cowboys and Indians stuff. So I remember having a bow and arrow and the fake cap guns and stuff like this. And that morning before it all happened, that's what we were, me and my brothers were doing. So. Um, yeah, f as for them, I know what people tell me. Um, I, I would assume they're a mix of me and my brothers and the different personalities and then family members that they had. So a lot of that is, is, is vague to me. I just remember more so the incidents, what happened, and then afterwards. Now, you and your brothers were, were separated. Yes. Uh, you went to live with different relatives. Yeah. That must have been difficult. That was extremely difficult. Um, families tried to keep us together at the times, but in, in the, the late 80s, you know, these are fishing towns and villages and taking five, five young boys is, is challenging. I know our aunt wanted to take us all to Boston, my dad's brother, but then the parish uh, priests and people just didn't feel it was correct to remove us from our surrounding areas. So we, we got separated, um, three brothers, Kevin, Peter and Michael went to live with Aunt Florence in Angers Cove. I went to live with my mom's sister, Aunt Betty, which was 10 minutes away, if that, um, in Patrick's Cove. Um, and then Bradley went to live with my other mom's sister, Aunt Shirley, in Emmanuel's in, in town. So you were essentially raised by your Aunt Betty yep. and your Uncle Junior. Yes. Tell me about them. Again, fishing, fishing family. Uh, me and my Uncle Junior were extremely close. Um, he had a stroke in late 80s as well, so his left side of his body was messed up, so I always used to be like his hands, especially as I got older. Um, his sons and daughters would move, move the way for work, so then I started fishing and doing a lot of the chores at an early age. Um, growing up around the bays is a little bit different. Not a little bit, a lot different. You kind of do everything for yourself. Um, the community, if you have a leaky roof, well, you people in the community help you fix it. If you have a problem with the car, you try to fix it. So we kind of fended and did everything for ourselves from cutting wood to hunting moose, rabbits, ducks, everything. So it was, it was always funny. I, I joked about what we ate at the time as, oh, I can't have moose again today or <laughs> having ducks today or lobster, like all the things now that are, you know, you pay Delicacies. top delicacy, <laughs> right? Or then when I started training at high levels, they're like, oh, if you can get moose, and a, I said, get moose, I got a, you know, you got a quarter and a deep freeze. So, you know, it was different, but at the time when you're a kid, you're like, oh, not moose and potatoes again. But that's what we lived on. You live off the land and you survive that way. So, um, normal fishing family from, from that part of time. Um, you have everything you need, but you don't have the extras. But it teaches you a lot of hard work and, and discipline. And they gave me a roof, roof over my head and gave me the support I needed to, you know, to be successful. Now, outs outside of uh, the, the home, yeah. uh, I guess your mentor was your gym teacher. Yes. That would be Gord Pike. Yes. Tell me about, uh, about why he was so influential or why he was such a good mentor. I, I, I think a lot of times that people don't understand uh, the role of a good teacher, you know, because they're, they're with your child or, in my case, with you, you know, nearly all day. Um, 
I was in a troubled time that you didn't. Re I didn't realize as I don't really think I always put that part of my past the fire and losing my parents behind me, and I kind of just blocked it out. And in the late '80s, early '90s, people don't talk about their feelings. You know what I mean? It wasn't no. something that we did, right? So everybody, no one asked you how you're doing. They just figured you were doing okay. Um, I found my love in sport, in basketball, and Gord was was my gym teacher. And something as simple as our school, the elementary school finished 15 minutes earlier than the high school, so we'd have to wait for the buses. So every day we would shoot in the gym, and he'd be finished if the class was available. So we'd just shoot and horse and different things and develop the bond. Then he coached me right up through. So not only coaching but guiding, so taught me biology. He was my teacher, gym teacher, and then in the higher classes, and then my coach. So now when you're playing, so not only are you with this person all day, now you're with him for practice, now you're on trips together, and now he's teaching you and mentoring always. He always used to tell me be hungry and humble, no matter what it was. And I, vivid, vivid things that he would do and little things that he would do that resonate right through my career. Like, uh, for instance, the last game I played in Newfoundland before I came back was our Provincials. Um, I think I scored 65 points. Uh, but he gave the MVP to someone else, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because that guy was grade 12 and I was younger and he felt he deserved it. You know, just always motivating, always. In, in that same tournament, I remember I dunked on a guy and I got a technical foul, you mm -hmm. know? But the whole place, like when I played back then, it was, it was the game to see. So I got a technical foul and he got upset, so he benched me and then he took me out of the free throw competition. So he was always teaching me to stay even course, to stay on, you know what I mean, stay focused, stay humble and don't let the nonsense yeah. get in the way. So yeah. we developed a great bond till this day. You know, when I came back to make decisions of coming back home, he was influential in that. He still comes in and, and helps out with some of the coaching stuff I'm doing at the academy. So we created a bond that will, it's unbroken. Mm. Yeah. Tell me about the homemade basketball oh. net on the highway yeah. in Patrick's Cove yeah. and, and the various versions of it. The, that was trial and error. So it's, it's very funny because we were out home this past weekend in St. Bride's and we were up on the old hoop up across from the school and the back of it was rusted out so me and my son were shooting and the rim went right down broken so he was out there and we were out there for a few days for a long weekend and he was bored so it was he, he ended up cutting the bottom out of a bucket I was like cut the bottom out of a bucket I was like that's what I started on and then him and his pop nailed it to a piece of two by six and put it on the shed and that's essentially was our first basket was a was the bottom of a bucket then we upgraded to a bicycle wheel right but all these things were flimsy then where it really started to go was, I remember for one Christmas, I asked for a basketball hoop. So I got the hoop and we ended up putting it out in the, in the driveway, but it was all rock. So I'll tell you some stories, but they're all in the book anyway. Mm -hmm. But to make this surface flat, I went and I took the pieces of the old pavement. So you see them in the thing. Now some of them I might have chipped off, some might have, I might have took a little bit extra that wasn't there. <laughs> but we got a drum then and we lit a fire and we, we heated up the asphalt to melt it and then we tried to put it back down to make a flat surface. So the things, the things I used to do just to try to create this court, it, it's, it's funny, but when we come to St. John's or we saw it come to town, and I'd see these people's basketball courts and I was just thinking they were the luckiest people in the world. Mm. You gotta understand, my upbringing of where I came mm -hmm. from, you know what I mean? And when I saw that, I was like, man, these kids are so lucky and no one on them ever playing. And I was just, that's all I was trying to build there. So then I convinced my aunt to let me build something and put it down on the, on the road. So that was the main street in and out. So that was trial and error, but we did, the one that actually still can worked was we got two six by six cut at the, at the sawmill. Mm -hmm. We put some fishing line in the middle because the ball kept going up and down the bank. There was a big drop about 50 feet on this side. And we put some fish tubs, filled them up with rocks. So we made our base, a couple of braces on it. The rim that I had on that was given to me from Gord, from the school. Mm. And then we just had a piece of plywood. And then to keep that on the back, I ended up taking a stop sign. <laughs> I took the stop sign to make the connection in between so it wouldn't pull through, through the wood. But that was the one that stood the test of time. And that's where I, I played hours upon hours upon hours. And your wife Mandy had an oil yeah. painting uh, done. She did. Of the of yeah. that. Yeah, we have that in our house. That's, yeah. a, that's a special one. Yeah. So just like little, little pieces like that is, 
that's what honed my skills. That's what made me when I, you know, the hours and the time. And I try to tell kids now what, like, it still gives me the chills because it's, it's what made me, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't need nothing fancy, but when I was there, our Newfoundland weather, as you know, um, when it was blowing a gale, I was working on my handles. When it was calm days, I was just shooting in between dunking and changing. But that's where I played hours upon hours. Like on a Saturday, I would play eight, ten hours a day. Like no given, no matter. That's what I was doing. And then it got to the point where everybody has up these slow signs. Well, everybody just slowed down. Some people stopped, take pictures. All the all the, the people coming from the ferry, coming out to see the Bird Island Sanctuary mm -hmm. from different parts of the country would take pictures, come in there and they were like, they couldn't believe that the kid was on, you know, on the hot, because this was our main road. So, yeah. you know, but for me it was, it was freedom. It was a place that just cleared my mind and that's what basketball did for yeah, me. Yeah, I guess it's not a stretch to say that in a way, basketball was therapy for you. <laughs> I didn't realize that at the time. But now looking back, 1,000%, you know, I, I felt I was troubled right up through, but this is something, to this day, I've never spoke to a therapist about what happened, you know what I mean? And, and none of my brothers have. Um, but to me, I think basketball saved me because it was, there was dark nights, there was lonely times, there was questioning why, why did this, why is this happening to me? Um, you know, when you don't have certain things or you want certain things or you get in trouble, you're like, you know, you, you that's what kept me straight. That's what, and I had this uncanny, like I just had so much motivation to be the best version. Like I always wanted to leave. I always wanted to play. Everybody thought I was crazy, but I'd watch. So we only had two channels. So we had CBC and NDB. Mm -hmm. So when my cousins, or like they were like brothers to me, went away to school, they come back with some VHSs of Michael Jordan games and these. And I always, my dream was always to play in college or to, to play at the highest level possible, which was the NBA. And everybody thought I was crazy, but I just kept working and working and working. And like I look at now the stuff that people do, but the stuff that I did was was just crazy stuff. You know, like I was walking around with ankle braces on me all day long. I was calf raising off the bathtub. I was doing your push-ups and sprints and everything that I felt to make me better, that, but I had no, no idea, no guidance. You know what I mean? What I'm mm. trying to say, my coach yeah. board would give me some things and I'd just do it religiously. Yeah. You know, I'd tie my right hand behind my back and only use my left. Anywhere I went, I'd dribble in the basketball. You know, so all these little things, if I heard of a guy doing something, I went home and done it. You know, so it was just something like that that just pushed me and motivated me. Did you ever have any doubts? Did anybody ever say to you, Carl, you know, you're crazy if you, if you yeah. think that you're going to be in the NBA or, you know, or whatever? Yeah, there, there, was, there, there was lots of doubts. Everybody, yeah. you know Newfoundlanders, if someone's yeah. coming out of the pot, they're pushing them right back in. So <laughs> um, there was doubts. My co Some coaches that I had on Newfoundland teams and things, they doubted me. Different people, you know, a lot of people didn't understand. You know, and there was times there's doubt there, but I never really doubted myself, mm -hmm. you know, and I just had this vision and I was, I, I was doing it and that was it. Yeah. That, well, it's all about attitude, I guess, yeah. and belief in yourself. Belief in yourself. Self-belief. If I don't believe in myself, how can you believe in me? Yeah. Now, you, you were mentioning about all the crazy things you used yeah. to do unsupervised. Yeah. Um, you did. You did one thing with your with your shoe, yeah, your yeah. trainers that yeah. actually ended up getting in, you into some trouble later on. Yeah. Right? we uh, there was jump soles out in these magazines, so we'd always try to get these basketball magazines. So there was this one that was out. They were called jump soles, and they were like two ninety nine. So what I did was I cut up some old shoes and I actually glued and and nailed them together, and then I taped them onto the bottom of my sneakers, and I would try to do what these people were simulating in the magazines. So basically all it was was, you know, you're straightening your cast and doing these plyometric programs, which I had no idea. Uh, I think, personally, all these stupid things I was doing just, just killed my ankles, you know, because you're, you're doing things that you probably shouldn't be doing. It's not normal for your body. But, you know, it was part of me getting better. It was part of me jumping. At the end of the day, I can't say it worked or it didn't, but when I was young, I could fly, so something worked. Um. When you were 16, yeah. you you uh, played in, in the Canada Games yeah. in Brandon, Manitoba. Yeah. Uh, that must have been quite an experience. Was that the first time you'd been off the island? Uh, I went off the island. I went to New Brunswick or PEI with Team Newfoundland at under-15s. 
Um, that was my first time. And then I skipped U17 and played for the Canada Games team. At that time was U19, and I was in grade 10, the summer of grade 10, going to grade 11. So I was the youngest guy, one of the youngest guys at Canada Games. Um, famous coach here locally, Clarence Sutton, um, mm -hmm. went out on a limb for me. Uh, Glenn Normore as well was the head coach. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, I started off at the bottom and had to get permission to play with all the memorial guys and different things. My aunt was super strict on these things and protective. Um, ultimately, I, was, I made the team and by the end of it, I was playing heavy minutes and I started a couple of games. So for me, it was an eye opener of what was out there. But again, when I came back that grade 11 year before I left, I was playing against university players and I was just above where I should have been or where, you know, just played with a, with a recklessness and, and a band and just played really strong. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, probably the, you're probably the only person uh, to play professional basketball who is also an expert at cutting the tongues out of the codfish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that just became way of life, Tell right? us how you became so expert. Well, you, you grow up fishing, so you learn everything. I'm, I'm the type of guy that if you're doing something there, I'm very intrigued on how you're doing it. I'm always trying to learn. So um, when we were fishing, you know, you had to cut out tongues, but I cut out tongues for another reason. It was to save up. Typically, you'd save up and raise money to buy your shoes and school clothes. So if it was picking bake apples or cutting out tongues, picking up beer bottles, like these are things that back in, like I said, in late 80s, early 90s that were just normal to do, like everybody did it, you know? So for me, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good at cutting out tongues. I'm getting good at filling now, but <laughs> and I haven't had a lot of practice. <laughs> um, rural Newfoundland yeah. re really is, um, you know, special yeah uh, in many ways but for you in particular i think you'd consider yourself to be a rural definitely person yeah it's why the, why is it why is that life so uh resonant for me it's the backbone of our province you know i mean obviously the town and city st john's and surrounding have everything they need to offer but when you grow up in rural newfoundland you learn life is from a different lens you look at it from from different especially back then things have changed now you know what i mean to access but for us for us to get to st john's when i was in grade five or six was was a luxury you know what i mean like oh we're going to get to go to mcdonald's oh we're going to you know what i mean you plan each year i think in grade six on we take a class trip Mm. And it was just to go to St. John's, go to the mall. You know what I mean? That was like a big deal back then. So I, I think when you grow up, you have the appreciation, A, for the land, mm. um, the hardship, you learn how to deal, you know, the things that I grew up doing, I'd love for my son to be doing. It's mm. going to make you a better person. It's going to make you a better man. It's going to make you stronger. Mm. Um, so these type of things that are inbred with you as you grow up around a bay, it just becomes normal. You know mm. what I mean? Now, the things, the problem now I feel with the Bay communities is now they're missing out because the schools are so small. Like Fatima mm -hmm. only has 32 kids. When I was mm -hmm. there, it was 220 and then worked mm -hmm. its way down. So they don't even have enough for a team or sports. So now it becomes to the point where now you're kind of losing out. So mm -hmm. yes, it's great to grow up around the Bay, but now you're losing out on the team aspects and all these things that that can bring you. So, but when we grew up there, you know, you had all the best, you had pride for where you came from. You know what I mean? And you, you had that edge and you had that fight. And when you came in to play the town, prov, uh, schools and things, you came in with that fire and you had some pride. You, you were proud of when you, where you represented it. When we won a tournament, there'd be 50 to 100 cars meet us and there's a motorcade. You know what I mean? And there was a celebration and you had these people follow us. Like when we played up in Beta Vert for provincials, they came with six busloads of people. You know what I mean? So they followed you. You were spe inside that community. You were special. You know what I mean? And now take it further for someone like myself or what we went through. Well, that type of town can nourish your development and they can get behind you and they can help you deal with it because everybody knows what happened to you. And they're, they're trying to be more thoughtful and more caring of what's going on. Whereas if you're in a bigger town, a bigger city, you're just a number. Mm. So that, that's how I view it. Mm. Um. When you finished grade 11, you yeah. moved to Ontario yeah. to go to school, and this was because you wanted to get a, a college basketball scholarship. Yeah. Um, that, uh, that time you spent in Ontario didn't 
quite, no. it was a little bit rockier than you thought it would be, right? Definitely, yeah. So the reason I, I wanted to get recruited, so um, one time they sent in, uh, there was a player that, there was two kids that went to, uh, from Mount Pearl to the States. Um, one of them came back and were, were watching me play, and I scored 40-something points, but nothing ever came out of it. Oh, he's going to tell his college coach about me, but nothing ever came out of it. It's just stories in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. So there was a flyer came out from Newfoundland basketball, and they were, you know, they were, they were looking at that type of pathway for kids going to the States or getting a college scholarship. And one of the kids on it was Andre Sola, and he went to George Washington, and he went from a school called St. Thomas Aquinas in Oakville. And I just told my aunt, I was like, I'm going, I want to go there. You know what I mean? I kept at her, kept at her. I said, I'm going. Like, you can't, I'm going. So I fished that summer to raise up money. And then I went up with her, her son, Howie, who was like a brother to me. And I lived with them because he was right on the border to go to this school. So then when I got up there, I worked with him for three weeks. He was framing Carpenter up there. So then I worked with him to get more money to pay for the school and things. So um, I went to St. Thomas Aquinas, big shock. I think 3,500 students in the mm. school, uh, uniform, full, full uniform, <laughs> uh, which was good and bad. I mean, you don't get to express yourself, but then, Very you know, British. Very British. <laughs> so as uh, for kids that can't afford the clothing, it's fine because now everybody's the same. So there's, it's good and bad. Um, so that was, that was a, sh a shock. The size of classes and the things they were doing was a shock. Um, but I just went there for basketball. So that was my soul. I was a good student. Uh, I was always a good student, but it was so basketball could not be taken away from me. That's it. My aunt was strict. You got to get good grades. Got to be here. I was like, boom, okay, done. Um, so I get up there. Um, the teachers go on strike. So I'm like, okay. So like St. Thomas Aquinas is here, and then it was P PMC or something was across the street at public school, and they were going to classes, but the Catholic schools were on strike. So I'm like, what the hell am I doing here? You know, I came all this way. I'm away from my wife, at most, my girlfriend at the time, and then my brothers, my family, everything. And I'm here to go to school. So I start training, but I met, uh, they had a weight room, and that instructor knew a guy. And then I got in contact with him. So I went and played with, uh, in this tournament, a highly ranked tournament, I played with Westwood Academy. So I was the only white guy. I played with Westwood Academy. So the first game, I scored 30-something points. Next game, I didn't get a pass. They were like, who's this guy? Shit, that, boom, boom, boom. You know, ain't no, no time for that. Mm -hmm. So I still played well, and from that tournament, I was getting some notice. So there was Syracuse, and these people were there. So I was getting some, some, some people were watching me and things like that, but they couldn't come see me play, right? So I, I took it a step further. I went and got a buddy of mine. So in this school, they had a video room. So I went in and I recorded. They could, I could do six tapes at a time. So I recorded over 150 tapes. I got the addresses from the guidance counselor. I sent that with my resume. My resume had on like dumb stuff that happened here in Newfoundland, like dunk champion in, you know what I mean, in the Wendy's Classic, things that they'd have no, no business understanding. And I put on some videos of just me in the gym doing this stuff. And then at the end of it, I put on a game of Fatima in that grade 11 championship. Mm -hmm. So I sent this to X number of schools, like 150 for lease. I, I found it when we were moving, and I found all the lists of the schools and me taking them off and, and what I sent out. The, the, it was like a trip down memory lane. The resume was the hilarious part of it. So anyway, that's what I did to get recruited, but then all these letters were coming in, we want to see you play, we want to see you play, but they couldn't see me play. Mm -hmm. So that kind of that killed it. They were following my progress. So then. I wasn't at the time, so there's, there's big ABCDs, Adidas camp, then there was Nike camp, and I went to another one in the same area, Atlantic Cape camps. So we got in this cube van and we drove down, seven or eight of us, with that coach that I met. And I went to that camp and I was MVP. So in that championship game, all these scouts came over from ABC and Nike, and after that I had about 30 scholarship offers. So I was supposed, Syracuse were putting me in a prep school. And they were late on the paperwork. I was after visiting this, the school, so the prep school would have gave me another year to develop, and then I probably have offers from wherever. So they were late with their paperwork, so I was like, "All right, I'm going to Hawaii on a visit." I was like, "I'll never have a chance to go to Hawaii." I, you got to understand, like, yeah. just take zero money. <laughs> and now I'm like, "Oh, why would I not go to Hawaii?" Because you can see, you can visit five schools a year. 
that's NCA regulation, she can visit five. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna go to Hawaii. And then when I got to Hawaii with the coach and the staff, and actually their assistant coach came to Newfoundland to recruit me. And he was recruiting me on the street, on the road, watching me play everything. I took him to Bird Island. It was it was pretty special. Well, that's a, that's a good that's a good place to yeah. to end okay. part one of our interview. Okay, uh, we'll pick it up from there. All right. Uh, when we return next time with our guest Carl English. Thank you for watching.